Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is Gregor Larson, director of the Paleogenomics and Bioarchaeology Research Network at the Research Laboratory for Archaeology and the History of Art at the University of Oxford. His research interests include evolutionary genomics, ancient DNA, domestication, human and animal dispersal, and phylogenetics. Larson gave a talk, Mutts and the Melting Pot, Gene Flow and Domestication and Human Evolution at the U of O on April 14th, 2015, as a guest of the Robert D. Clark Honors College. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. First off, what are paleogenomics and bioarchaeology? Good questions. <laughs> Start at the beginning. <laughs> uh, paleogenomics is really a shorthand way of talking about the sequencing dead things. Things that, uh, you, genomics is the generation of genomic sequences, genetic sequences from living things. Paleogenomics is just doing exactly the same thing with things that just haven't been around for a very long time. And bioarchaeology is just a way of thinking and looking at archaeology using the biological remains from archaeological sites. Now the ability to do um, bioarchaeology, that's been probably pretty radically transformed in the past 20 years, right? Well, she's even less. I mean, mm -hmm. just in, in less than a decade. Um, for what I do, which is to generate these sequences, I mean, the, the step change has just been enormous and unprecedented. I, I, if you told me five years ago that we, could, we would now have the capability of doing what we're doing, I would have laughed in your face and said, no way, that's impossible. We so, couldn't possibly do that. So why do you have that capability? What's happened? It's the revolution in the sequencing technology. It's the re amazing drop in price and just the sheer volume of, of genetic sequences that you can generate from uh, genetic material that even is, you know, in some cases, several hundred thousand or even more than a million years old. It's, uh, it's insane. So what led to your focus on those fields? What, how'd you get there? How'd you wind up doing what you do? I, I read a lot of Stephen Jay Gould. Uh, it was, I took a course called, well, I was supposed to take an evolutionary course in college, but it was at 8 a.m. and <laughs> I'm not a morning person and it just, that wasn't going to happen. So instead I was taking, uh, my degree was in environment, economics, and politics, and I had a various number of other criteria that I needed to uh, tick a few boxes on, and it was a really cool course that I thought called Literature in the Age of Darwin. And it was just looking at novels and poetry that in sort of the second half of the 19th century to the present and how evolution had influenced various writers' perspectives on human relationships and just the way we look at the world. And we let a lot of uh, Robert Frost poetry and, you know, and enumerating or thinking about uh, design and something so small and all these. It was just great. And we sort of near the end of the course, we hit... Um, the, uh, the professor told me that I should read Wonderful Life and just be thinking about Steve Gould and and I didn't know who Gould was at that stage and I read Wonderful Life over a weekend and I just thought wow this is this is phenomenal and then the year after I graduated I was on a Watson Fellowship in Central Asia with a whole lot of time on my hands and just there was a, a local American library and I just devoured everything that he wrote over there and I got my mom to send me books and books and books and I just couldn't get enough of it and I just thought it was absolutely amazing and uh, I was watching a, a documentary about dogs or something a couple years after that, and I just thought, I mean, I'm clearly not the first person to have this insight. I think that was probably Darwin who realized that domestication was a phenomenal um, proxy for looking at evolution and that you could look at it small for over the last 10,000 years with human selection, and that would be a way of trying to think about evolution writ large. And I just thought, wow, this sounds like a whole lot of fun. And so that's how, that's how it all got underway. So you mentioned dogs. Mm -hmm. So the talk is titled Mutts and the Melting Pot, Gene Flow and Domestication and Human Evolution. So um, give us a gloss on that. Just, you know, what do you mean by that title? So What's it going to be about? What's it, what, what it's about, I think, is our heretofore, I would say, and I'm probably just... This is my own shortcoming that I'm now Im imposing upon the rest of humanity to say that because I didn't know about it, I'm sure you didn't know about it either, although I'm certain that's probably not true. But I think there's been a general underappreciation of the role that gene flow and what we call admixture or hybridization has played in the evolution of all species on Earth, and I think we are included in that. And I think there has been a real tendency to think of species as sacrosanct and that you, I mean, it's the whole idea of a biological species concept is mm -hmm. that you cannot mate and produce fertile offspring. And that makes us think about bio, it makes us think about the natural world in very fixed ways. And so that you have nice big bounded rings around individuals and you say, well, that's a species and therefore, you know, you can't change it from there. 
Um, and I think that with the, the sequencing revolution that's come about now and our ability not just to generate but to analyze individuals and populations at a genomic level, what we're seeing is that there's gene flow everywhere between things that you wouldn't have ever expected were necessarily even able to run into one another, much less mate, produce fertile offspring, and then and go from there. And I think that, for me anyway, that has been an enormous uh, shift in the my own understanding of the way that evolution works and what that then means for not just the evolution of our own species, but for the evolution of all of our domestic species as well. And once we think of hybridization not as an unusual thing, that is just sort of a rare, oops, that was, sorry, that was an accident, or something that we accidentally proliferated, but it's something that's been occurring throughout the history of life on Earth, it gives us a completely different impression about how things have all come into being. So this means, correct me if I'm wrong, that we, we tended to think about evolution as being the result of chance variations in the genome of particular mm. species? More, I think, when we were thinking about evolution at, on a big scale, we were thinking about the model of the tree. Mm -hmm. And that's the classic drawing from Darwin's uh, uh, diaries where he draws a slight sketch out of a tree and you've got the branches coming off and he circles this and the, he, next to it he writes, I think. And it's the whole way that you, as, as an evolutionary biologist, you get taught about biology, which is, in the parlance, bifurcating trees. Mm -hmm. You have a node, and you get a split, and mm -hmm. then there's a split, and there's a split. And, and these what, splits do not meet. Once the they splits split, do not meet. No, and, and when you look, it's like looking at a tree when you go out onto the, the lovely University of Oregon campus with the Arboretum. All the trees bifurcate. Mm -hmm. Every branch at every smaller level. Your lungs bifurcate. Mm -hmm. Highways bifurcate. Mm -hmm. every, so it's when it's the opposite process of what is known as reticulation when the branches suddenly start coming back together again. And then it's the hybridization of two things that were separate coming back together and becoming more, more bush-like in a way. In fact, we don't even really have a decent plant analogy because you mm -hmm. rarely see two branches coming back and forming a single mm -hmm. hole again. But really, what's happening in evolution, yes, there, without question, there's bifurcation. But the reticulation side, the, the merging side, the hybridization side has been I wouldn't say ignored, but I would say not quite as appreciated as it really probably should be. And we are now kind of figuring out, hey, this is happening all the time everywhere, and this is really fascinating. So I, I saw a uh, talk that you gave online, and, uh, you know, I'm an English prof, so having you say, you know, you got turned on to this by reading literature about mm. evolution, that's great. But you also s told the story, you said, um, uh, you quoted a line from the movie Jurassic Park. Mm. When the character played by Jeff Goldblum says, "Life finds a way." Yeah. Um, what? Why is that important? What, what does that mean to you? I. What I again, I think what it means is that we, we have our own impression of of the biological world, mm -hmm. and we see trends and we call those rules, and then we put bounds around them. We say, "Okay, that's how it works, and that's how we expect it to work, and nothing can break that." Biology is messy. It's sloppy. It's just, and sometimes it's ugly, but like Jeff Goldblum said, and what I think is probably the most prescient thing that's ever been said about science in any Hollywood <laughs> film, which is that life finds a way. And that when you say two organisms, these two things, oh no, and I, I love the arrogance of the scientist in that, in that shot, when he's like, are you suggesting that two females can breed? And Goldblum is just like, oh, well, I, you know, he's, he's flustered, he's like, I don't know, it's not what I'm, I don't know, I'm just saying, I have no idea what the mechanism is, but I'm saying, life finds a way. And he puts an uh in there and it makes it more, you know, <laughs> he's a much better actor than I am, clearly. But he, what, what he's saying is that even when we don't understand the mechanism, we don't understand how something is possible, it doesn't mean that it isn't possible. And that what biology shows us is that things that we would never imagine in a million years happen readily and frequently and there is always a solution that's found even if we are blind to it. So give me an example. Can you give me a, a, an example of something that shouldn't happen, shouldn't have happened, but it did. So I think that um, it's, well, and I'll, I'll talk about this in the talk, I think the, exa one, the example that I like coming back to a lot is, is humans and Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. For, we are very good at uh, splicing and separating out and, and delineating. And especially when it comes to us, because we are, of course, <laughs> you and I, especially, <laughs> terribly uh, important and intellectual and you know, all, these, all these things that make us better than the other. And we were never, I mean, we, there was a lot of other homo species out there. Sure, we recognized that we was a bushy family tree to start, but we are the only one left, and therefore we must be superior to all other forms. But again, there must have been this bifurcating model, and every time you see trees of human evolution, it's always bifurcating the whole way. 
But then there's been a lot of speculation about humans and Neanderthals. And uh, my team, I set them a task a little while ago. I said, okay, the prize is I will buy any, the first person who can find the earliest literary reference to the prospect of humans and Neanderthals mating from the discovery of, of Neanderthals in 1878, I believe. And the, f and the first one we've been able to find after, I think it was 1911. So mm. it wasn't that long afterward. And people mm. were already like, uh, the amazing thing is if you type into uh, a Google Scholar search, humans, Neanderthal hybrid, and you limit your search to all articles that appeared prior to 1950, it's a little, I don't recommend doing this at home. It's a little scary. You get hit with the most aggressive racism <laughs> that, that is just entrenched, embedded in, in, in an academic style of writing. Mm -hmm. like, oh. And what a lot of it was, very early on, was people were speculating, most people were saying, no way, humans and Neanderthals, two totally different things. But then there were people who were like, you know what? In order to give us a rationale for the existence of other inferior races, mm -hmm. It must have been that humans and Neanderthals made it, and that gives us a mechanism for describing all these kind of lesser people out there who mm -hmm. aren't us. Mm -hmm. It's just phenomenal. So th then for a long time after that, we get, thankfully we moved a very long distance away from that, um, and there was still a lot of speculation in the 90s and early 2000s about how you know, humans and Neanderthals, unlikely at best, unlikely. And then the genome comes out, the Neanderthal genome, and it's like, oh, yeah, okay, so every, all non-Africans on Earth have about 3-4% Neanderthal, and some ridiculously high percentage of the Neanderthal genome writ large is somewhere in the human population that's currently on Earth. Well, okay, that's a pretty big reticulation between two species that were supposed to have been good species and separated in very distinct morphologically, behaviorally, cognitively perhaps. I mean, that's been a big argument. Oh, but when given the opportunity, sure, no problem. Let's mate and have our offspring survive and reproduce enough so that there's a big legacy and a big echo of that in our modern genomes. So what are the benefits biologically of this hybridization? Obviously, it happens. Yes. Is it a good and, thing to happen? Well, so this is, this is the fascinating thing, and this is where I think the, real, the cutting edge right now, and this is what's fascinating, is super exciting to me, is that people are working out what parts of the genome that are influencing what makes you you, what makes me me. Mm -hmm. and what gives us certain advantages or, or certain susceptibility to disease or whatever else. And then when you can associate parts of the genome with parts of your morphological or behavior or the rest of what you would consider the organismal level, then what you can do is you can start to say, okay, uh, what parts of those genomes then have been brought in maybe selectively and have given people an advantage? And there's this brilliant paper out recently about how people living in, in Tibet, high altitude, hmm. Most of us uh, do pretty well at, at sea level. Uh, you bring us to high altitude. I've had altitude sickness. It's not fun. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult for people who are raised at sea level to, women to, to carry through pregnancies at very high altitude. People in Tibet have less of a problem with this. And it turns out that there is a large chunk of the genome that they have that differentiates them from everybody else at low sea level and even relatively close related people like the Han Chinese in East China. And that fragment of the genome, which possesses a couple of genes which allows them to be able to survive much more readily at high altitude than the rest of us, looks like it came from Denisovans. Hmm. Now wait, what are they again? Denisovans, <laughs> yeah, so nobody even knew that they existed, right? I mean, what was it, 10 years ago, you said the word Denisovan, everybody like, what is that? I don't know. <laughs> So there's a cave in Siberia. They find a finger bone. They, oh, nobody knows what this is. This it looks is like a little bit weird. Ago, yeah, years no, ago. three, four years ago. Yeah. They, they sequence the DNA from the finger bone. Oh, look, it's a completely different, totally novel human lineage that we never knew existed. And the way that I've heard it described, which I think is just brilliant, which is that it's a genome in search of a fossil. Because nobody, you know, the human anthropologists who've been looking for years for all over Africa and everything else and find a lot of stuff never thought, why would we find something in a cave in Siberia that is radically different than anything before? And not just radically different, that radically different from Neanderthals, distinct from them, but have also hybridized with Neanderthals and hybridized with modern humans, and humans who possess a certain chunk of that fragment are now better able to live at high altitudes. <laughs> what, are you kidding me? And the thing is, it's not even just people. There's examples from butterflies and examples from mosquitoes where hybridization is, isn't just kind of a passive thing where you're like just, oh yeah, that one's attractive and so fine, you know, it's opportunistic. It's that act actively recruiting elements then of that genome that you inherit from that hybridized pair that then becomes selectively advantaged. So you don't have to necessarily have to evolve something on your own, you can just acquire that bit from somebody else. Mm -hmm. Now you're talking about evolution, which is a lot more dynamic because rather than everybody having to invent it, you just have a reticulation process and now, okay, well you've already developed that toolkit, we'll take that on board and we can run away with that and do all kinds of stuff. It's amazing.
So this sounds, I mean, it sounds to me like the implications of these discoveries uh, in terms of our understanding of evolution, you just said it. I mean, it makes evolution become much more dynamic much than more we so. ever realized it yeah. was before, except maybe when we believed in Lamarck, right? Because there was a, but this is like totally, totally. a new frontier. Yeah, it's, you, we, before yeah. when you had trees and trees only, everything was canalized. And you had an independent lineage splitting off and then it was just by itself the whole time. Now you have that lineage possibly then acquiring through uh, hybridization traits from other, sometimes not even very closely related things, which mm -hmm. give it a dynamism and give it an ability to survive in new environments, give it an ability to, um, to, to move into new environments where it hadn't existed before and giving it capabilities, almost like you're a, a brand new car which has just been tricked out and now you've got all this new stuff on board, not because you had to invent it, but because you just got it from that guy over there. Super cool. It almost turns biological evolution almost as a more similar analogy to cultural evolution where mm -hmm. you are, people have allowed, and of course they do, right? I can tell you something and then mm -hmm. you, you acquire that capability. Mm -hmm. You can learn. Biology is now kind of trending in that direction, which is, I just think, it's just fantastic. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's really interesting. So you, you talked about this kind of um, dynamism that exists in evolution. One of your other areas of study is the actual physical dynamism of species and human beings migrating mm -hmm. across the face of the earth. Um, why is that something that interests you? Are you just like a dynamism guy? <laughs> You're into anything <laughs> dynamic? I think it's probably fair. Uh, <laughs> I, I, anybody who, why would you not be interested in dynamic things? You know, I don't know many academics who go, you know what, I only like the staid stuff. Anything that's got any <laughs> interest only, to it, I don't, don't like it. it. They don't yeah. admit it. <laughs> something that's not changing over long periods of time, that's what I'm... Um, what I like about that, and that, uh, that gets back to this Goldblum thing as well, mm -hmm. which is that when we start thinking about what's, what's possible, and how do we move, and why do we move, and where do we move, and whether or not that's of our own volition, or whether that's just something intrinsic to all species. And I sort of, I like this idea that there, there is, you, you have, say, a population in a, in a bubble, and a bit like a balloon where the pressure of the air is, is expanding that bubble the whole time. I almost kind of like seeing species in that same analogy as well, where there's this pressure to expand. There's this pressure to just keep pushing against those boundaries. And every so often, you're able to get through those boundaries and then spill over into the next thing and then keep pushing at those boundaries. And you can think of all kinds of analogies where that's not just um, behavioral boundaries or phenotypic boundaries, but then also geographic boundaries. And the number of times people have seen what really attracted to me about this in the first place was when you look at a lot of islands, there's stuff on islands that has no business being there. And our, again, we are smart and we are important, so everything must be deliberate and everything must have a very ready mechanism. There are, on the island of Sulawesi, which has been separated off from every other island in Southeast Asia for a good five million years at least, there are three very large mammals with no ability to fly and no ability to swim. So how do they get there? And nobody really knows. And so, but we find this time and time again, where it's like if life is given an opportunity, all it takes is once, it will, it'll get there. And even if you don't understand why or how that's possible, you should just know that it's going to happen and then it's for us later to try and work out what is it about it, rather than us writing it off as an impossibility to begin with. Now, I, I saw in the talk that you, one of the talks that's online, there was a similar case in Greenland, mm. right? So we, we said, couldn't be, couldn't be, couldn't be, this is an island, no way, no way. But there it is, and they figured out how. So say how. Yeah, so that was more Iceland than Greenland. Oh, so Iceland, what, okay. Yeah, so what you have is you have Arctic foxes on Iceland. Now, fox is very good at, especially the Arctic fox, where you can move across ice floes, does so chasing lemmings all the time over ridiculous distances. I mean, 4,000, 5,000 miles in a year. It's just crazy. They put radio collars on them, and it's like they're still going. So, and you look at the distribution of the Arctic fox, and it's everywhere, and where it looks like it's not, there's two land masses where it looks like they're separated by water. In winter, it's not. It's fully iced up because it's the Arctic and everything mm -hmm. freezes. And so you, as, you know, you, if you're walking, you don't know whether or not you're walking on land or water because it's, it's, it's all ice. Green, or Iceland, rather, isn't connected to Greenland during the ice flow. So how do you explain the presence of Arctic foxes on Iceland? And there's, they can't swim there. They're not going to fly there. What's happening? So what it looks like from the genetic analysis we did of some of the ancient bones that we found, and given how um, uh, the lack of variation in those things that we found before the, l the last little ice age, which was in the sort of um, 14th, 15th centuries, the last ice age, the last small little ice age that there was in Europe, and it plunged temperatures in London, and people were skating on the Thames, and it just, it was actually, it created quite a bit of havoc in Northern Europe. 
there was enough sea ice in the North Atlantic to allow a temporary land bridge between Greenland and Iceland, and the foxes get there. And that's the whole point. It just needs one shot. So this and is it's one there. winter. Ah, maybe a couple of winters. winters. A couple of winters over 100 years. And the last time I think the ice was grounded on Iceland, uh, between Gr Iceland and Greenland, was late 18th century. And since then, it's been cold, there's been a lot of ice, but it hasn't been a, a total a land bridge there. But as soon as you're getting one land bridge, maybe over one season, foxes are there. They just, and that's what I mean, things are constantly pushing at those boundaries. You give it just a half of a chance, and boom, it's there. Then the ice disappears, and now you've got Arctic foxes on Greenland, or on Iceland, and hey, great, everybody's happy. And they're doing just fine, thank you very much, and evolving. But as the Earth gets warmer, and the, the ability for that ice to form in the winter decreases every year, the likelihood that there's going to be another pulse of foxes decreases all the time, which means you might now have a bifurcating split between the foxes on, on Green, excuse me, foxes on Iceland and the foxes on Greenland and everywhere else where they're going to be drifting off because there's, it's completely severed the gene flow between the foxes in the two places. And then in theory, eventually, they could become uh, unable to hybridize. That would, I mean, they have to. Over a long enough period of time, that's where you go. If you're not having gene flow, the barriers to that gene flow are always there, and then you just start acquiring enough differences where then it limits your ability to produce fertile offspring. You're also interested in animal domestication. Very much so. So how'd you get there? What, why? How does that connect to all the things that we're talking about? That's, for me, that is, that is evolutionary biology. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that fascinates me about this is that Darwin felt like at the beginning of Origin of Species, he had to start people off easy. He had to be like, look, this is not such an outlandish idea, and here's why. Because, you know, there's these pigeon fanciers, and there's people breeding chickens, and they're doing the same thing. They're selecting for traits, and then they only, only select for those guys, and we're differentiating dif populations. So, evol so then he calls this artificial selection mm -hmm. to set up natural selection. Now, the downside for me is that the long-term legacy of this is that it has allowed evolutionary biologists to maintain that dichotomy between artificial selection on one hand and natural selection on the other hand so that something like domestication isn't real evolution, mm -hmm. which kills me. Of course mm -hmm. it is. Of mm -hmm. course it's real evolution. The, the, the artifice of that dichotomy was there only in 1859 to get people used to the idea. Since then, there's no point of that. We know that evolution is artificial, natural, whatever, it's all the same thing. It's about selection pressure and differential survival and reproducibility. That's it. So whether we're talking about short time scales or long time scales, it's the same thing. And what kills me about it is that because people have looked at evolution or domestication and said, well, that's not really evolution, it's colored our view to make us think that evolution is just about dinosaurs. It's just about long term stuff where you've got stasis for long periods of time and then really nothing and that very, very slow change. When in fact, evolution is it's happening, and it's happening fast all the time, but we tend not to look at it that way because, oh, well, that's only the effect of artificial evolution, and that's us. Not true. And it's, these genomic studies indicate that there's all these species out there that have domestic evidence that, that somewhere in their genome there are domestic animals. I mean, uh, I mean, are there animals that were domesticated, then stopped being domesticated? And sure. Yeah, and so there's the whole feral populations. Mm -hmm. I mean, and there's lots of these. I mean, even horses in North America. You know, we, there were horses here up until about 11 or 12,000 years ago. In fact, horses evolved in North America. Then they go extinct as part of everything else that went extinct, which is a real shame because all the great megafauna that was around from, you know, before 12,000 years ago was just, what, imagine zoos with megafauna in them. It's just beavers the size of Volkswagen bugs and giant ground sloths 15 feet tall. I mean, it just would have been amazing. Instead, <laughs> it's depopulated. We don't have it anymore. And horses go extinct, too. The Spanish come over, they reintrodu reintroduce the horse, and the horse is like, oh, yeah, it's like they never left. And so most of the horses, that, a lot of the horses that are the, what we call the wild stallion, it's not wild, it's a feral horse that was domesticated for a long period of time, brought over to North America, and then they've just been running free since. So there's quite a few feral populations, and those are interesting as well because it's not, you don't then revert to a wild type. Mm -hmm. You take on the appearance in some cases and the behavior of what wild populations do, but you go, because have, you've gone through this severe change and selection as part of the domestication process, you are now retrofitting. It looks like wild, but it's not. It's actually been through this process, and you can't wind that back. You're now finding new solutions for that, which gets us back to Goldblum. Hmm. Everything goes back to Goldblum. Everything goes back to Jeff Goldblum. Um, so one of your current grant projects is focused on the cultural and scientific perceptions of human-chicken interactions. Chickens. Tell us about that. Chickens. Um, Andrew Lawler just wrote a brilliant book uh, where he pointed out that we, we don't know anything about chickens. And so there are seven billion people. How many, how many chickens are there? I have no idea. Take a guess. Seven billion people, 
50 billion chickens? 21 billion, right? Three chickens for every human on Earth. They, the, the mass of chickens is greater than every other domestic animal, plus rats, plus mice combined. There are more, I mean, chickens by number, by mass, they just dominate everything. First dog show in London was, was preceded by the first chicken show by 30 years. People were fascinated with people doing chicken stuff before they were even doing dog shows. I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. <laughs> so they are ubiquitous. They have been part of human culture. They are on every continent. They are part of whatever people have been doing it for a very, playing with chickens and being around chickens for eons. And we know nothing. We know less about chickens, given their ubiquity, than we do about any other domestic animal. And this project is, is seeking to rectify that. We are looking at the archaeology. We're looking at anthropology. We're looking at um, ethnography. We are looking at uh, a deeper history of the his use of chickens and religion. We're looking at modern uses of chickens and chicken shops. We're looking at commercial breeds and winnowing of uh, genetic variation. And we're combining that into uh, just a, a sea of data and information with experts in all kinds of different things just to figure out what the hell is going on with humans and chickens. We don't know. <laughs> so we have two minutes left. This is my, probably my last question. Um, anybody who watches your videos, talks to you, um, realizes that you've, you've got a gift <laughs> for communicating about very technical scientific um, procedures, facts, uh, research in ways that English profs can really appreciate, okay? I mentioned to you that a couple of weeks ago I interviewed Franz de Waal, who's mm -hmm. committed part of his career to explaining to the public about this scientific research that he does. You seem like a natural for that gig. Have you ever considered writing a book like that? Uh, book? I, I, mean, I feel like I have a couple of ideas that I'm playing with for some book stuff. I don't know if books are the best way to communicate ideas like that. I mean, and they take, they take a lot of time. <laughs> I, 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 the people who write books and can do so quickly, I have enormous respect for. I've, I'm not quite there yet. I may be somewhere down the road. But I am I'm very committed to um, uh, publicizing and promoting science and getting people excited and enthusiastic about the work that scientists do. Because you know, if, if we don't understand what's going on and we're not providing the narratives to place our own understanding in the re natural world, then who is? And I, you know, I just, I, it's fascinating and I just would love to get the word out there. Well, thank you for getting the word out with us today. Thanks so much for taking the time. Very happy, thank you. I've been speaking with Gregor Larson, director of the Paleo Genomics and Bioarchaeology Research Network at the Research Laboratory for Archaeology and the History of Art at the University of Oxford. He gave a talk, Mutts and the Melting Pot, Gene Flow in Domestication and Human Evolution, at the U of O on April 14th, 2015, as a guest of the Robert D. Clark Honors College. Thanks so much for watching.